Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning into my YouTube channel. I would like to share with you a little bit about my infant loss story and where I am just over two years later. So if you are new to following me, I will go ahead and kind of give you a rundown of my background and why I'm talking about this. So I'm 33. I have two beautiful children. One I've adopted and he's two, his name's Warren. And then I have a seven year old girl named Scarlett. And in 2016, my husband and I decided that we were going to grow our family. So very quickly I became pregnant and we had a pretty good pregnant pregnancy experience. Um, I was healthy, I was feeling good. Um, but then at the 20 week ultrasound, we found out that our son Jack had Down syndrome. And initially this destroyed me because I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I didn't understand what it meant to be a special needs parent. I didn't know if this meant my son wouldn't even make it. I just heard the words Down syndrome and my ignorance to that caused me to completely fall apart. So in an effort to kind of get a handle on how everything was going and where things were headed, I went and I interviewed a bunch of other families who had kids with Down syndrome and I quickly fell in love with these kids and I became excited about my pregnancy and about becoming Jack's mom. Um, at 32 weeks, and guys, it may seem like it's easy for me to say these things um, and easy for me to talk about it by, because I'm just kind of just saying it, um, but I have spent the last two years in and out of tears and I've gotten really used to being able to talk about it now. So I hope you don't take this as insensitivity. So when I went, I, you know, one morning I was feeling my belly and I, I didn't feel him as active as normal. Um, and then later on in the day, I was pressing on my belly and I, he was in the same exact position. His butt was up on the top of my stomach and he was just not moving. And if I were to press on his back, he would kind of move a little bit and he had it moved. And so I said, okay, I'm not gonna panic. I'm not gonna freak out. I'm gonna go um, until tonight. If I don't feel anything, then I'll call my doctor. 10 o'clock rolls around, we're laying on the couch and I looked at Eric, my husband, and I was petrified. I said, I said I was gonna wait till 10 o'clock before I jumped to any conclusions. I waited. I drank orange juice. I, did, I exercised, I did whatever I could to get him moving and I never once felt him move. So I called my doctor, she said, get in to the hospital just so we can ease your mind so you don't stress out. To be honest, when I went into the hospital, I kept telling myself, everything's okay, everything's fine, you're gonna be okay. There's no way this is happening. There's no way this is real. I get there, they instantly find a heartbeat and I knew it wasn't his because it was like 130s and that was mine. And I knew with babies, it was a little bit higher. So when he, when they brought, told me that it was 130, I just knew it wasn't him. And they still, they couldn't find it. 15 minutes went by and they brought in a resident. They did an ultrasound. And I, the first thing I saw on the screen was his lifeless body. He was hunched over and just not moving. And there was, you could tell he wasn't alive. There was no heartbeat. Um, and the resident looked at me and just said, I'm so sorry. And I can't really remember what went through my head in that moment, but I know that the feeling was pure anger. I was so pissed because I had gone through 32 weeks. I had fallen in love with this baby. I prepared myself for a major life change, going from one, having one child to two, and then finding out that I'm gonna be a special needs parent and preparing myself for that. And so I, I remember laying back in the hospital bed and screaming, no. And it, it was more of this like animalistic response. It wasn't like shock, it was just no, 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 no. And, and I, I looked at my doctor and the midwife and I said, is this real? Am I dreaming? And they both said no and, and they felt so bad. They were crying right next to me. And they said, you know, do you want to go home for a little bit and process the whole experience or do you want to go through with delivering 
the baby now. And I was like, please don't make me deliver him on top of having just lost him. Now you want me to go through a real delivery to deliver a dead body. And that right there was like salt on the wound. The wound was already there. And then somebody jammed a bunch of salt in the wound. And I lay there and I, I had to make that decision. I'm going to go, I'm going to have this baby tonight. And I have to be strong enough to withstand hours of labor, just like I did with my daughter, but there will be no reward at the end. In fact, it will be a tragedy. That coming to terms with that was sickening. It was awful. It was impossible. And I remember looking at Eric and being like, they're going to have to give me some drugs. Like I am going to get the epidural. I don't care. Like drug me up. I don't freaking care. I don't want to even feel this. I don't want to be alive for it. I don't want to be around for it. Give me all the Xanax, like whatever. And I'm in no way condoning substance abuse. But when you're in that state of mind, and if you've gone through what I've gone through, you know that sometimes you just want to disappear and you do not care how. And in that, in that night, I my game plan was to get as high on pain medication as they will let me. Whatever's legal. Like I'll take it if it's legal. And we did the, um, I think it's called Cervidel, the medication to make you go into labor. And I was like, this pill is just gonna make me go into labor? I couldn't believe this. And we sat in the hospital room and we just looked at each other and I said, this is, I don't feel like this is real. I feel like I'm dreaming. I, I honestly have no idea what to feel. And as the night progressed and things started to really set in and I started to, I started, it started to become real to me. I was throwing up. I started to throw up because of the idea of having to give birth right then and there and not being prepared. Um, the idea of how unfreaking fair it is to give birth to someone that's not alive. And then to feel his weightless body in my stomach was a whole other experience. I would, I kept moving him, just willing him, willing him to wake up, please. And I was so alone in that night, in that moment, being in that bathroom by myself, shrilling, crying, throwing up. It was awful. And in that moment, I really had no faith to hold on to. I was upset. I was angry. I hated everyone. So I went back to the room, um, fell asleep, got some rest, woke up at 8 a.m. in labor. And I was so upset and so exhausted from crying and hyperventilating and throwing up. And I asked for um, Stadol. So we did that. And I just laid there staring at a wall. I had no idea how to react to what had happened. I just laid there staring at the wall. And out of nowhere, my body was in full blown labor and I was too late for the epidural. I was already, at a I was at a 10 centimeters. Um, I don't know how I magically withstood that without screaming, but I just laid there. I was in so much shock. I almost didn't feel anything. And when they said, you know, right about seven centimeters were like, do you want the epidural? It's probably too late, but we can still try to give it to you. And I was like, no, actually I want to feel every ounce of this pain because it's going to make me feel alive and feel the pain that my son felt when he died. And so I, I gave a few good pushes and he came out and he was beautiful. He was absolutely perfect. Every inch of him, his eyes, his skin. And what was really hard was how cold his body was and how dark his lips were. And he, I just kept crying and holding him and pretending that he was real. You become somebody else in that moment. You are not with it. You become almost crazy. And I, I had him in my arms and I just started singing him lullabies and telling him how much I loved him. And every time I put my nose against his, it was ice cold. I'll never forget how cold his face was. And so they gave me an entire day with him and I, I held him. And 
and then I said goodbye. And when I finally watched his body go, and I said my final goodbyes, this feeling of feeling destroyed, feeling like a failure as a woman, feeling like a failure as a mother, feeling like I had lost something so dear to me and feeling so angry and upset. The anger took over everything. I was so sad, but the anger was worse. I was angry at everyone. I blamed everyone and everything. So we went home and I began to abuse the medications that I was given. I started drinking heavily. I started smoking cigarettes. I was really looking for just about anything to numb the pain. And then um, within a month or two, I was pregnant again. The pregnancy was hard because I was still grieving Jack. I was very depressed. I was very sick physically. I had, I had lost a ton of weight. I was losing hair. I had been diagnosed with Hashimoto's right after that and hypothyroid. And so, but my mindset was, there's no way lightning's gonna strike twice. There's no way I'm gonna lose another baby. And so I bought a Doppler on amazon.com and I just listened to my belly every single day and it gave me hope. He's there, he's coming. And we found out he was a boy. We found out that he didn't have any genetic issues that we had to deal with. And so the day for my 20 week ultrasound came and I felt him the day before. I got my Doppler out, all cheerful. Like I get to see you today. And I just, you know, I just want that peace of mind before I drive in to go see you. Cause I remember the last time I saw an ultrasound and I never want that to happen again. So I put the Doppler on my belly and I could not find his heartbeat. And I had found his heartbeat several times before that. And I knew exactly where to look. So we get to my doctor. She says, oh, I'm sure you're okay. I'm hysterical. Ultrasound time, we see him. Same exact lifeless body. And I flew my body back and I just screamed no again in the same anger. And I thought to myself, there's no way I'm going to survive this awful tragedy. There's no way I'm going to be able to move away from this. I felt like I was never going to have more children. I felt like a failure as a wife, as a mother. I failed my two babies that passed away. I took it all and I made it into self-hatred, self-loathing. Um, my self-esteem went down the pooper. I lost all of my faith. Um, and then I was sent home, you know, we delivered and I was sent home to now what? And I was faced with the decision because I have a seven year old daughter. I was faced with the decision of, do I go back to the same behavior when I was pregnant with, J or when I lost Jack and abuse substances again, sleep all the time, not show up for Scarlett. And I remember one morning she came into the bedroom and she put her hand on me and I had been sleeping for three days. And I said, mommy's getting better. Mommy, mommy will be back, I promise. And she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, mommy, you don't need baby Jack or baby William to make you happy. Scarlett can make you happy. In that very moment, I was like, mama, you have got to get your shit together. You cannot let this little girl down. You cannot let the loss of your two babies hinder the parenting and the relationship with the baby that you have that's alive. And so I got my butt up and I started to walk, go for walks. I started to exercise again. And I kept thinking about the possibility of adoption and that gave me hope. And I kept doing the little things every single day that I knew made me healthy and happy before. Granted, in those first few weeks, they didn't make me healthy or happy. I didn't feel a ton better, but I knew if I just kept going through the steps, maybe if I faked it, I would make it. And I just needed to keep going for my daughter. 
And then one night I was laying in bed and I was crying and I was, I was talking to my babies and I said, please tell, tell me what you want me to do. I want to honor your life. I'm not going to just go and ruin my life because of this. I want to honor you too. I want to be the best mom that I can be for Scarlett. And I want to be the best wife I can be for your daddy. And this instant thought came over me. If my boys were alive and if they were my age, they would want me to just go on living as happy and as healthy as I could. So I immediately started therapy and I saw a psychiatrist and I was able to get on an antidepressant. I was able to start therapy and slowly I started to feel better. I could tell that the real me was coming back. And every single day, I just focused on what those boys would want for me and their sister. I kept every morning, I would go into Scarlett's room and I would kiss her face and just stare at her and just count my blessings that she came into my life and I had her. I had a healthy, beautiful daughter and I needed to appreciate her. And so every single day, just a little reminder, Jack and Will would want you to get up and do your thing today. Don't let them down. Jack and Will are watching you from wherever. They see what you're doing and you can set an example of giving up or you can set the example of moving forward. And I almost felt guilty at first moving forward. I felt like I was a bad mom for not grieving them harder, but I had this little girl that I needed to show up for and I had my future self that I knew I wasn't gonna give up on. So I started exercising 30 minutes a day. I, I started trying to eat better. I was taking my medication every single day, seeing my therapist once a week. And um, after a few months, we started to look into adoption. And we knew it was gonna be expensive. We knew it was gonna be overwhelming and crazy. Um, but every inch of my soul told me it was the right thing to do. I wanted to take the anger and energy and excitement and frustration from those losses and put them into something positive. And so we decided that we were going to adopt a special needs baby. Boy or girl, we would have let, we wanted to have a boy, but we said boy or girl, whoever needed us most. And it was scary, scary thought because wow, we're gonna go from this comfortable family of three to a family of four with a special needs child. And we were not ready but we had mentally prepared ourselves for a baby with Down syndrome with Jack. So we were mentally ready to be special needs parents. So that's what we did. And going forward and putting myself into a po something that's positive, a positivity project, knowing that I was going to do something major um, in the name of my boys, in their honor, I was going to give another boy or another girl an amazing life. And I promised my boys that I was going to do that. And there was no stopping me. That anger, that frustration, that energy, I poured it into finding my baby. I poured it into saving the money, raising the money, putting the money aside, selling things to get the money. Adoption is so expensive. And um, fortunately, special needs adoption isn't as expensive, but it ended up being pretty expensive. But I poured my heart and soul into finding my baby. I poured my heart and soul into adoption awareness and connecting with other moms who had infant loss happen to them before. And between pouring myself into those relationships and getting to know other moms who had stillborn babies and then going through the adoption process, I had a mission, I had my mind busy, and I was going to honor my boys. And that's how I chose to do it because I wasn't feeling like I was healing. I didn't feel like I was healing until I got Warren, my son who is two who I adopted. I didn't get that feeling of I'm living my purpose, everything's okay until I put Warren in my arms. The day he got in my arms, it was like bricks had been lifted off my shoulders. I finally had my son. I finally was able to bring honor to my boys by bringing that love and energy and that hope into Warren's life and giving him an amazing life. And 
funny thing, I say giving him an amazing life, but truly he gave us an amazing life. He is such a gift and a blessing. And people say, oh, he's so lucky to have you guys. You're so amazing. And I'm like, no, we're lucky to have him. We are so lucky and so grateful for his birth mother, his first mom. Every single day, I count my blessings and I thank her. I've never met her, I never will. Unfortunately, we have a closed adoption, but I send all the loving vibes her way. She's an awesome chick, I'm sure. And I got busy just focusing on healing, being Warren's mommy, being the best mommy for Scarlett, appreciating them so very much and just pouring my heart into raising awareness for adoption, special needs adoption, um, and just being the best mommy that I could for them. And also supporting and talking with other women who had gone through miscarriage and stillbirth. I really loved getting involved on Facebook group pages, um, different forums. So anytime I saw someone struggling, I reached out, I shared my story with them, we talked. It was a huge, huge healing factor for me because I was connecting with other women and we were growing together. A lot of them were going through the adoption journey as well. So it was nice to have that sisterhood. I will say that every day that went by between adopting Warren and um, losing Jack and Will, it was excruciating. But I just went through the steps of life. I cried at the drop of a dime. You can ask my husband, we'd be in the grocery store and I'd see a baby and I'd just lose my mind. I'd run into the bathroom sobbing. Or we'd be driving down the road listening to happy music and I would start hysterically wailing. And Eric didn't really understand it. And I think it's because it's a mom instinct thing. Something was missing in my mom instinct jar and just something was so broken inside of me. And every time I saw a mom with other kids and getting, they were getting frustrated in the grocery store. Every time I saw a baby, I lost it. And I just kept my blinders on as much as I possibly could and just focus on finding Warren, going on, um, contacting um, different adoption agencies, contacting um, people that facilitate adoptions, contacting our local adoption agencies, just getting into contact and networking with whoever I could, networking with other adoption moms, networking with other infant loss, stillbirth moms, and just getting my name out there um, and just focusing on all the amazing things I was gonna do once I got my hands on Warren. But I also decided before I started the adoption process that I would be happy where I was. I didn't want to go into being a mother for Warren and being hysterical and depressed and angry. There was, I wanted to be a happy, healthy mom for him. So during that waiting period of six, seven months, I just focused on keeping my mind busy. I focused on my work, my business, being the best mom I could for Scarlett getting through each day. It was like every breath was hard some days and every day was a victory if I went to sleep and slept fine. Um, but the one thing that really has kept me going ever since, you know, bringing Warren home and going through all of it is reminding myself that I have to choose to be happy. I have to fight for my joy. My joy and my happiness is the most important thing to get back for the kids I do have. My joy, my happiness, my self-worth has got to get fixed before I even meet Warren, before I even adopt. It has to become, I have to get healthy. And I didn't push it, I didn't force it, but every single day I spent time in meditation, I spent time in prayer, I spent time giving back and spending time with my daughter and just focusing very, very closely on my mental health. And that was very hard. I took a lot of me time. I took baths and went for walks and contacted friends and just sat on the phone with other moms that were going through what I went through. And that helped me kind of bridge the gap between becoming Warren's mom and losing the boys. And so here I am, uh, Warren's two. So it's been two, two and a half, three, almost three years since everything went down in 2016. And here I am, the happiest, the strongest, the most um, awesome, badass mom that I could be. And I contribute this joy and where I'm at in my life right now and, and the healing to the constant reminder that the, the boys are watching me 
and they need me to set the right example. And my kids that are alive need me to be happy because I let them down if I'm not happy. I let my husband down if I'm not happy. So that was my project. For the last two years, it was project get Anita happy. So it meant exercising every day. That meant eating healthy every day. That meant reading personal and professional development every single day, spending time in meditation and in prayer, traveling with your family, getting immersed in culture, um, and then writing letters to the boys. I wrote a lot of letters to both Jack and William, and I felt like they were hearing it. I know that sounds weird, but I just felt like they were hearing it because I felt comfort come back my way. So if you are struggling and if you've gone through what I've described or if you've had a stillbirth or a miscarriage, please feel free to email me, follow me on Instagram, message me that you watch this video and I'd love to connect. Um, I'd love to kind of share any advice I could with what I've been through. Again, it's all about what you do up here. You've got to get this right as soon as possible for your future kids, for the kids that you have, for the kids that you lost, for your spouse, for your future self. You owe it to yourself to be happy. And so that's got to be your number one goal. And you have to take it one day at a time. It's not going to happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight for me. It took years. But every day I made it a priority to at least put some time in for myself. So. Thank you guys for watching. That's my update two years later, where I'm at and how I'm doing and a little bit about my story as a mama to an adopted son and two babies who are in heaven. Thanks so much for watching.